morning to support our event. My name is Uma Graham and I run the club Thrive on Plants here on campus and we're really excited to have all of you here to support our event and it was actually all of your support throughout the semester with our paint and sips and our cooking classes um, that actually got all the funds together to make this a free event for you today. So thank all of you. And uh, thank you to Veg Fund and the Office of Health Advancement for covering the catering costs today. So I hope you all enjoyed some of our brownies and our Wayfair pudding. Um, and stick around later. We're going to have lots more savory treats out for you. All we ask in return is some of your feedback in our surveys. And it will actually help us get more of these foods offered here on campus. So stick around for that. But in the meantime, I would like to get into the wheat and potatoes of today's events. <laughs> um, uh, our first speaker today is someone that's been a huge personal inspiration to me in becoming an activist and starting this club here on campus. She is the senior editor of Veg News and the executive producer of the podcast Our Hen House. And most recently, she is an author of Always Too Much and Never Enough, which is a memoir of her childhood, her coming out, and her struggles with body image and healthy eating. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Jasmine Singer. Hi. Yay, thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. And thank you to Uma and everyone here at Thrive on Plants. I do love Montana. And so I'm excited to be here yet again for, uh, this is, I need like maybe 10 minutes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm really excited to be here yet again for just experiencing your big snowy sky. <laughs> that was surprising. I'm coming from California now and I didn't expect that, but I do, I do totally love it. And so today's topic, which is unifying social justice, is one that is very, very important to me on all levels, both like personally and as an activist, not that there's much of a distinction between those two things, of course. So I want to kind of untangle that a little bit. But before I do, uh, let me give you a better idea of like who I am and, and why I'm talking about these issues today. So as Uma said, I am the co-founder and co-host of Our Hen House, which is a nonprofit media organization that I started with Marianne Sullivan nine years ago. And we produce podcasts that work to change the world for animals. And uh, we are in our ninth year, so today was episode 428. So, <laughs> thank you. So clear your schedules, because you have a lot of listening to do. And I'll be back in like two weeks for a pop quiz about it. <laughs> And so what I love about our hen house is that I was just actually just talking to Lisa like one second ago about how at the very beginning uh, we were told, are you going to really have enough people to interview? And you know, thousands and thousands of activists later, we could literally produce an episode every day. And maybe we should, I don't know. We also produced the Animal Law podcast and a, a couple other podcasts in the works as well. I'm also the senior editor for Veg News. Uh, you could grab a copy over there. So it is, thank you. It's the leading vegan media brand in the world and it's been in existence for 18 years. So about a year and a half ago I moved out from New York City to California to work at Veg News. And what I love about it is that it's at Walmart and we're really trying to like mainstream this by putting like amazing vegan food on the cover. But what I love even more, and the one thing that got me out of New York City, because I never thought I would get out of New York City, was that I get to spearhead the politics of series. So even though we're getting people to pick up the magazine because of the amazing food on the cover, uh, really what I'm most passionate about is that we get to use the magazine to explore certain issues such as the politics of prison food and right now I'm editing a piece on the downfall of dairy and I just finished editing a piece on the human toll of factory farming. So one of the through lines in the talk that like I'm going to be chatting with you guys about today and also what I think Lisa will be talking about a bit is that really these are all different spokes on the same wheel. 
I came to the animal rights movement by way of the LGBTQ movement, and at the time, about I had just gotten out of college, so it was like 16 or 17 years ago, and I was an actor educator with an AIDS awareness theater company in New York City called Night Star. And I was a longtime vegetarian by then, the kind that only ate, ate eggs and cheese. <laughs> and I, don't, I actually didn't eat a vegetable until I was 30. I'll get to that in a minute. And so I started to recognize the commonality in the mindset of the oppressor. And it was around that time, of course, that I met a vegan. And we all know how that story goes. <laughs> You meet a vegan and then you see a video and you read a book and then you're here 16, later, 16 years later. But anyway, I, I feel really grateful that that happened because it was around that time that I pivoted my career to become a writer. And one of my first published print articles was called Coming Out for Animals and it was from Satya magazine. Do you remember Satya? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's now defunct but all of the articles are available online. So definitely, if unifying social justice is a concept that you're intrigued by, look up Satya Magazine. Anyway, this was like my first print article. I was like terrified. I had no idea really what I was doing and I was talking to all of these activists who had been uh, really bridging the gap between animal rights and LGBTQ issues for so long. And what I realized was that it's the mindset of the oppressor that is the commonality here. So really, we can, we can rationalize oppressing or marginalizing any community by saying, insert the blank group is there for my use. Or saying, I am better than them so I can do whatever I want. Or saying, oh, this one's my favorite. I can do whatever I want because God said so, right? So rational, once you get to the God said so argument, it's like past the cupcakes. But anyway, <laughs> the final line of the article is, sliced to death is sliced to death. Whether a slaughterhouse worker or a homophobic bully happens to be holding the knife. So by the way, I just wanna say, I was like, I don't know, in my mid twenties when I wrote that and a lot of the people who I was interviewing for the article were like, guiding me through writing this article. And one of them was Patrice Jones, who wrote that line. I didn't write that line. I just thought I'd give credit where credit was due. Um, but anyway, so coming to the animal rights movement by way of the AIDS awareness movement really helped me to contextualize my whole life, like a life of being bullied. A life that, I'll, I'll actually be reading a few little snippets from my book in a few minutes, but it all became like this holistic worldview that I was having, that it all informed my animal rights activism and the way I approached my writing, my thinking, my media making, and my personal interactions. So I have this little video, it's about four minutes long, and I want to show it to you because it, it, I produced it and uh, it was shot like maybe a couple years ago, and it just talks a little bit more about these particular connections. It was really liberating to realize that I could incorporate animal rights into my own life mission. <laughs> <laughs> Food absolutely is an activism. There are people who will say, oh, it's not show me the animal you saved, but you know what? By not eating an animal, that's one less that had to be killed. When you think about you know, being gay and being vegan, I always kind of see the coming out process as very similar. For both of us, it's about being who you are. Coming out vegan was harder. When I came to coming out to like my family in particular as vegan, that was just kind of done in a whisper, literally in a whisper. <laughs> I think that it was a lot easier for me first to be vegetarian and go through that struggle and have a lot of people question my decisions and question my lifestyle. And then going out as a lesbian, I knew that my lifestyle was for me and that I had to stay strong. I watched a film, Farm to Fridge, and that's the moment that I went vegan, that I recognized the suffering that's going on with animals and factory farming and it changed me on a cellular level. I actually came into the animal rights movement by way of the AIDS awareness movement, and a friend of mine had showed me some footage of factory farming, and I like was 
blown away by what was going on. I really didn't think of it as a social justice issue until much later. It was an emotional issue. Are we going to be in the 21st century and live together and share the planet with the animals, with the trees? And for me, when I went vegan, it was about I want to be on a peaceful vibe. Eating a murderous pie was like, why would you choose to do that once you know? Uh, why? I was sort of drawn into uh, AIDS activism back in the early 90s with ACT UP. I do think that form of activism, being able to take something that was invisible and make it visible, has completely informed my sense of activism for animals. We first met, ironically, when I was writing an article. I, I cannot believe you're telling this story. I know. I don't know why I am. Stop me. Stop me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, desserts. <laughs> Those are vegan French macarons, and then of course mixed berries, and we have coconut cream. I actually like to double fist it, so... <laughs> I think there's a lot of gay people in the animal rights movement, and personally I think it's because we're just we're a more compassionate group. Most of us have experienced some sort of discrimination or bullying. What I've begun to realize is that these are beings who cannot advocate for themselves. They don't have our language. They don't have our skills. But I can take their place. I can be their surrogate. I was writing an article about the connections between gay rights and animal rights. It was 2006 when I wrote it. You were ahead of your time. And I interviewed you for it via email. I had heard of Marianne Sullivan. and. The quote that you gave to me never made it into the article. It's so, that's like the meanest thing. And I'm sure it was brilliant, though we don't really know, do we? Because <laughs> it was never made it into the article. And then we actually met in person, again, ironically, at the LGBT Center in Manhattan. One of the things that I think is most important for anybody who's working in a social justice movement is the importance of allies. And, and we all know that if a movement is going to succeed, it can't just be coming from the people who are oppressed. They have to lead the way, but they need allies among the people who already have the power. I mean, this happened in every uh, social justice movement that's ever succeeded. It was very surprising to me to find that people in the LGBT community did not view animal rights in the same way I did. And it baffles me that if you're going to fight for equality, why aren't you fighting for equality for everybody? For, you know, veganism and being able to speak out is a statement and being out and gay is also a statement. It's about being who you are. Yeah, thanks. So I just I wanted to show that because I um, it's just good and it speaks so well to these issues that that I'm most passionate about. And, and I'm going to pivot a little bit, but these topics are further explored in my book, Always Too Much and Never Enough, which is like a roundabout journey to seeking personal authenticity. And that's a journey I hope I'm always on. Well, actually, I'd like to reach it like 10 minutes before I die, just so I know, like, okay, this is it. But other than that, I hope it's like this ever-evolving process. I really do. And it's... It's interesting, we were just talking about this, I was just talking about this uh, right before I came up here, about how the idea of being always too much and never enough is something that is in fact universal. Now that's only annoying to me because I didn't know it when I was growing up in the fluorescent 1980s in New Jersey when I thought it was just me. Always too much and never enough, like taking up too much space in the room but never enough, like not able to ascribe to what society wanted me to be or um or what you know my mom wanted me to be or what like i wanted me to be because i was really unable to access that authenticity food was my best friend it was my my lover you know it was my sage it was my confidant and i was this bully kid like i mentioned so when i got home that was what was there what I didn't realize then was that food is the most personal political issue there is. And what I also didn't realize was that I was part of this like system that was relying on my willful ignorance to not only consume animal products, but also to constantly consume more and more and more. As my book goes into, these are the foods that are designed for us to overconsume. They're designed to manipulate us, 
just like the marketing schemes behind them. They're designed with the perfect amount of like fat to salty to squishy to go down our gullet at the exact precise speed and hit that part of our heads, our brains that can never be sated. So that's what I was a part of, you know? And that's something that really stuck with me until I was well into my veganism, actually. I'm gonna give you a short reading from my book right now to give you an idea of where I was at with all of this when I was 17. Food, especially fast food, had not faded in its ability to comfort me as I stumbled through adolescence. If anything, I loved it more and more each year that passed. Double cheeseburgers were now the name of the game, providing me with the steadiness and solace that I coveted. They were always there, always the same. Of course, there was a darker side to this relationship. Perhaps not surprisingly, the more of them I ate, the more of them I craved. They satisfied me until they didn't. They assuaged my angst until the absence of them added to that angst. Such is the definition of an addictive relationship. Not that I thought of it that way then, but I wasn't stupid and I knew that I was somehow in the middle of a vicious cycle of eating crappy food and then feeling crappy about my body. Still, my love was too strong to resist. By the time I got a car, an enchanting 1986 Toyota Camry that I called Henry, which only accelerated barely if you stepped full force on the gas pedal, there was no longer an obstacle between me and eating a second or sometimes third dinner. The fact that I was petrified of driving on highways was not a problem because just down the road was a strip mall with everything I could ever need. A grocery store, a Chinese place, a pizza joint, a brand new shiny Taco Bell, and of course, my first and still greatest love, Burger King. A tub of chocolate icing from Food Town was the perfect appetizer to a dinner of two cheeseburgers, extra large fries, and a vanilla milkshake. The blessed drive through was like icing on the cake, or the pie, as it were, since the apple pie at Burger King was always an option to go with the shake. I would sit in the hidden part of my parking lot, blasting my Patti LuPone cassette tape, and eating my dinner at record speed. It was how I imagined heaven. I scoffed to myself when I thought of those kids who, like me, wanted a buzz but wasted their money and their brain cells on drugs when they could have this much better, cheaper, legal, more functional high. <laughs> who needed marijuana when you could have the perfect orgasmic combination of fatty, sweet, and salty that made french fries with ketchup so succulent? While my teenage journals were full of incredibly tormented poetry that made Sylvia Plath sound like Dr. Seuss, what I really should have been doing was writing love sonnets to my cheeseburger. Nestled behind the protective shield of Henry, whom I perhaps anthropomorphized a bit too readily, I finally felt genuine. I took a bite of my burger and I was myself. There was no other place in my life, not even in theater, not since the incident with the heckling, where I was safer, where I was calmer. I sipped my shake, and in my head, I had already escaped to New York City, where I knew I would live one day, and though I wasn't entirely sure whether I wanted to be there so that I could achieve anonymity or fame. <laughs> As I took a break from my burger and dug deeper into my tub of icing, my hopes and fears arm wrestled in my head, both certain they were destined to win. I will be incredibly famous. I will be amazingly fat. I will star on Broadway. I will be ugly. I will be rich. I will be a failure. I will be legendary. I will be forgotten. I will be loved. I will be loathed. I found that the faster I ate, the more rapidly my desires pushed my fears away and the faster the image of Margaret and my other bullying classmates faded. So I picked up the pace and sprinted to the finish, licking my fingers to make sure no morsel would go undigested. I ate until I didn't remember that I was a reject, or at least until I didn't care. My stomach and heart swelled with satisfaction and I felt full of life. The irony, of course, is that it was death I was full of, but I didn't see it that way for years. At the time, I was simply awaiting the cosmic high I received from the buttery bun, the smoky patty, the smooth shake that tingled as it slid down my throat into my soul and grounded me at my foundation. 
So these are issues that I get into in my book and you know it's been really interesting because when I was on tour the bulk of my tour was two years ago which is when my book came out and I went to like 60 cities <laughs> and people all over the place were like me too, me too, me too. I always feel like I'm always too much and never enough. It's how it affects me personally and politically. It's how it affects my philanthropy and how it affects my relationships, my most intimate relationships. So how do we bridge all of this with social justice? How do we bridge all of this with like our view of ourselves as authentic? And how do we show up for ourselves in a way that is actually supporting a liberationist perspective when it comes to compassion for everybody? Well, I think it probably starts with ourselves. I'm just gonna throw that out there. Uh, it came as a very long lesson for me, and it's one I'm still learning. From the time I was eight until the time I was 30, I was what the world saw as the fat kid, which according to them meant I was less than. Now pay attention, because this is the theme here, how easily we push some individuals aside and celebrate or at least accept others. So it wasn't until I wound up switching my focus from vanity to self-care, like getting out of this horrible loop-de-loo of this food addiction mentality that I realized what I was actually dealing with. And at that time, I lost like 100 pounds. And that's when the world started treating me differently. And that's when everything shifted permanently. It left me with this huge sh you know, chip on my shoulder because after a young adulthood of being overlooked, which followed a childhood of being bullied, when people started to pay attention to me and feel like my viewpoints were valid, I didn't believe them. And I started to question what kind of power I was giving away by allowing other people's perceptions of me to define me for who I was. So this is another theme that is in my book and it's actually the reason I, I got the book deal because I wrote an article called, it was just about how after I lost all this weight people started treating me differently and like I woke up the next day and it had a hundred thousand Facebook likes. <laughs> like it had gone completely viral and that just so pissed me off because I have been writing about animal rights and veganism for so long and I was like that's the article that goes viral but from that you know I realized that people weren't talking about this. They weren't talking about how easily we push certain groups aside based on like what is society's view of beauty or society's view of like acceptance and and for me I had jumped the fence and so that was what was unique about my story I had jumped the fence from something that the world had previously ignored to something that the world was celebrating or at least accepting the man next to me at the mailboxes in the lobby of my building smiled at me I secretly held my breath convinced I was about to get mugged <laughs> He lingered as I grabbed the eclectic mix of lamp catalogs, tax documents, and Chinese restaurant menus from inside my tin box. It took a minute for me to recognize him as my downstairs neighbor, a harmless looking guy who had never said three words to me in the five years since I'd moved in. I used to try to strike up a conversation with him and with the other people who lived there, but to no avail. So I gave up trying, saving my energy for more important things like chewing. <laughs> Admittedly, it had seemed odd to me to not offer the common universal courtesy of hi, or at least a head nod. After all, my neighbors and I knew extremely intimate details of each other's lives. I could smell what they were cooking for dinner, I could hear when they were arguing on the phone, I could easily catch accidental glimpses of them in the hallway, unloading their groceries from their granny carts or unloading their problems onto their partners, and I'm sure they knew the same things about me. So why they never said hello when we passed in the hallways always baffled me. And why I eventually took their lead and ignored them right back perhaps baffled me even more. But I got over it, figuring it was a New York City thing. Folks here were too cool for hellos, too busy for small talk. You came here to be famous, not affable. <laughs> my neighbor was still standing there. I shut and locked my mailbox and faced him, smiled just a tiny bit, lifted my eyebrows. I was guarded, but I was present. If you want to talk, talk. You just, you look great. 
he started shaking his head left to right a tad maniacally. I mean, I hope it's okay for me to say that, but gosh, do I even know your name? I'm Christian. I let a second go by realizing what was happening here. I'm Jasmine, I responded, still somewhat guarded, perhaps more so actually, and thank you, I added. That's very nice. It's astonishing. I mean, wow. Christian was the one looking down now, acting somewhat embarrassed, one hand in his jeans pocket, the other one cupping the back of his neck. He was still shaking his head. How much weight did you lose, can I ask? I laughed nervously. My laugh was far away. I rubbed my thumb on the lamp catalog, wondering if they had any lampshades that weren't made of silk. Thank you, I said again, ignoring his question. That's really nice of you. And on some level, it was. After that day, when he would see me, Christian would go out of his way to hold the front door when I was carrying too many bags to comment on the weather, when we were again at the mailbox, and even every now and then to remind me that I looked great. My name is Thin, and I am the queen of this prom called life. Anyway, so how does all of this come together? You know, it finally took me getting accepted, for me to realize that getting accepted, it didn't really matter to me anymore. This, this idea that we can celebrate some and marginalize others was this wake-up call that my activism had needed. Like I keep saying, how quickly we brush others aside. How unconsciously we celebrate this group. And you know, it's just because why? Like they don't conform to the status quo. So once I finally let go of allowing other people's perceptions of me to define me, something amazing happened. It was so uncomfortable. <laughs> I started to recognize all of the ways that I was allowing my perceptions of others to define them for me. Oh, I hate moments like those so much, when we have to like call ourselves on our own crap. It's like, oh, what is up with the fact that change doesn't happen unless we're uncomfortable? And since I didn't know how to get out of this judgment loop, I decided to go with it and to use it as this conscious trigger. So whenever I felt myself judging a stranger, like, oh, they're so tall, oh, they're so short, they're so big, they're so small, it would stop myself, stop. And I would breathe and I would say, do you feel healthy and grounded that day? And that's an important question that I constantly ask myself because I tend to spiral. I mean, you could tell I have like a big energy and a lot is going through my mind all at once. But when it starts to just get off of the issue at hand, which is like animal rights and social justice as a whole and self-care, then that's when I'm like, all right, take a step out for just a second. You know, I, um, it's funny, I've said this before, but as like a tattooed vegan lesbian animal rights activist with an obsession with my pit bull and like this really loud habit of tap dancing across the room, I know what it means to piss people off just by being me. <laughs> but you know, it's ironic because the root of what I want to stand for is compassion, right? For myself first and then for all of those other individuals. The ones we so easily brush aside, the ones we don't call beautiful for whatever reasons, the ones that we don't see. <laughs> It's really so simple if you think about it. We live in this whirlwind of assumptions about others and about ourselves and we're just not gonna grow until we recognize that the way we view ourselves is born from a conscious choice to accept and even to go so far as to love what is and then to relentlessly challenge ourselves to reset our judgment as compassion. It, for me, began with looking in the mirror every single day and every single day making this choice to not only have hope in this world that feels so hopeless sometimes, but to no longer ascribe to a belief system that someone somewhere along the way told us we should hold as our own. And that's something that I feel like could really empower us, to, could really embolden us. I don't know if you're as angry and frustrated as I am these days, but I feel really good knowing that I have the choice of what I choose to consume, the foods I choose to consume, the media I choose to consume, the media I choose to make, the people I surround myself with, and the mindset that I wake up with. No, that's not true. I don't wake up with it. Most of the time I don't wake up with it. It's a choice. I have to decide. Today I'm going to be hopeful. Today I'm going to be grounded. And today I'm no longer going to to a belief system that someone once said I needed to hold. 
that animals are food, that chubby is not okay, that certain individuals, insert the blank here, there's so many blanks that we can insert, are less than us because God said so, because I can do whatever I want to them, because I have power over them. No, fuck that. It's time that we have to reset this as compassion, but we can't really accomplish it until we first look in the mirror and do it for ourselves. So I was a long time vegan before this all like kind of came together for me. I was already writing these articles. I was already making these connections with you know various different spokes on the wheel of social justice. And I lived in New York City where there were like 150 vegetarian restaurants. And so I saw the subway map as this elaborate web connecting the vegan panini in Soho to this Butterfinger shake in Williamsburg to this like pizza on the Upper West Side. And I figured it was like my moral code to try them all because after all it was for the animals. <laughs> now the silver lining here is there is a vegan version of every single animal product out there. Check. <laughs> I tried them all so I know. <laughs> but what I was missing in that equation was what I needed in order to thrive and it wasn't until I kind of switched gears and realized that the 30 years at that point uh, that I had of eating only complete junk food. That's, like I said, I didn't, eat a, I didn't eat a vegetable until I was 30, was something that I needed to rid myself of in order to start to look at my life holistically and really start to thrive as a person to become a better activist and a better friend and a better partner, and just a better all around Jasmine. So, you know, I had grown up like not eating real food. Do you know, do you remember those like, they probably still exist, those little, diet meals, they're like, they were Weight Watchers meals in the 80s, but they're probably still something or other. And they, they were like the size of the palm of my hand, they were like these little white cardboard squares and you would like put them in the microwave for like four minutes and they'd still be frozen in the middle. <laughs> yeah, Lean Cuisine, Jenny Cray, all of it, I did it all. And that was what I ate because I thought that food was just this mechanism to like lose weight or to like ascribe to society's belief of what I should look like. It never occurred to me that food could actually be nourishment. I only saw food as deprivation and it never occurred to me that food could actually be an important political statement. So I first made the connection to veganism uh, and it, the, and own the political side of it, more so than the personal. And I think a lot of people actually go about it the opposite way of me. But I first was like, oh, I can no longer eat animal products. Here's why. Okay, so I was 22 and I was working for this AIDS awareness theater company and I met this vegan, as I mentioned, and I went to see this documentary and what I, what I did was I sat there in the front row and I saw these animals who were being torn away from their mothers. And I sat, now pay attention to how I'm telling you this story. I'll explain why in a minute. I sat in the, like, the first row and I watched this horrible footage of these babies, like they were screaming, you know, you've seen the footage. And I thought of my own broken home as a child. And like, my heart hurt, what? <laughs> my legs started shaking and it's weird because my legs don't shake in general. So I just always, that was a long time ago and I always think my legs were shaking that day. And at one point I had so much energy that I like jutted out of my seat and I looked around like, oh, sorry, sit back down, look back up at the screen. And I was a vegetarian by then for a long time. Like I said, I only ate da dairy and eggs and I saw these egg laying hens and these dairy cows and I was like, oh my God. <laughs> They're being like exploited for their female reproductive parts. Oh, this doesn't work with my view of feminism for myself. And I thought of how I myself had been exploited for my own female reproductive parts at various points in my life and I just couldn't do it anymore. So I went vegan. Now, the reason I told you that story was partly because I wanted you to know a little bit more about what my story has been like and how I started to piece together like this idea that like we don't actually have to be part of this system that is this truth that someone once told us we should have, but also partly because I really strongly believe in the power of personal narrative as a means of creating social change. I don't think that our society or ourselves are going to change until we start to question in ourselves what has brought us to where we are today and until we find our own truth and tell somebody. 
whether that's in writing or in art or just having safe spaces around us. So when uh, my book came out, my agent had given me this piece of advice to like, anytime I feel like I'm proselytizing, to take a step off of my soapbox and like tell the story of how it affected me. So if you're here and you care about uh, animals and you care about social justice, I guess what I would say is the through line that I have seen in the thousands of interviews I've given is that the uh, main ingredient that holds people's attention is when you tell your own story. It like does that magical thing that happens when you see a play or some kind of theatrical presentation and like there's that like fourth wall created and the person who you're talking to allows like themselves to listen more open-heartedly than if you were saying I watched this movie and these animals were in these crates and they couldn't stand up and they couldn't turn around and they couldn't extend their limbs no people are gonna shut down so find your truth and tell your story I hope that the animal rights movement in particular can really latch on to this a little more than it has been able to uh, because I think it's one way that we'll really be able to affect change. I, I honestly believe that food is the most personal political issue that there is, and I feel really good knowing that I can make the choices that I make. I also feel good knowing that, like what happened a few minutes ago, I can be okay in my discomfort. We're not going to grow as a society unless we're super uncomfortable, unless we like break things open. And unless we allow ourselves to stand in the discomfort, when, when did it happen for you? Was it like when you questioned your own internalized homophobia? Was it when you questioned your speciesism? Was that when you went vegan? Was that super uncomfortable? Because it was for me. It was super uncomfortable. And the only way that we're able to like then become this kind of higher self version of us is when we sit in that discomfort. That can't happen unless we're questioning assumptions that we have about the world. Uh, I recently had a super uncomfortable conversation with someone who called me on something that I had publicly said like 15 years ago. And I was like, yep, you're totally right. <laughs> And I was so grateful for that opportunity. And I think that that's like another important quality within change making, which is humility. Humility is not taught in schools. I don't know why, but humility comes after you get older and you realize that nothing you knew is real and then you start to like get depressed and then you like go to therapy and you maybe take some Prozac or something, you get rid of the Prozac, you try and change your eating, you find some friends, you realize they're not good influences, you leave them, you get in some toxic relationships, you break up, you go through heartbreak, you eat some vegan Cheez-Its and then what? What? You realize that you needed humility all along, so you're welcome. I'm saving you of all of that if you haven't done it yet, because I have. And I'm here to tell you that humility and personal narrative and change making through arts are three of the most important ways of creating social change and unifying social justice. I hope that that is something that uh, you can hold on to from like today's talk is like how can I find my truth, who can I share it with, and how can I practice a mixture of self-care, which we're all familiar with because it's like the big buzzword finally, and collective care, which is something that Patrice Cullors talks about, one of the founders of Black Lives Matter. What is it? It's realizing that like Nancy here, who's next to me, is not doing so well. I'm going to help lift her up. I'm going to actually take on a little bit of caretaking right there in like a way that is not only right when she's about to burn out, but also just from a holistic perspective of like creating stronger systems that uh, allow for activists and caregivers and students and teachers to show up better in a healthier environment. I think that's what our movement is going through right now. Just like being like broken open so that we can create like a stronger foundation. And it doesn't happen without collective care. And that doesn't happen unless we're like looking at everything within ourselves that we think we're right about. Back to humility. So humility, finding your truth, having a creative outlet, having a safe space, collective care, uh, and avoiding those toxic relationships. I'll just throw that one in there too. <laughs> Why not? Anyway, I, you know, I, what time is it? I have no idea. It could be like five hours later. It's because I took my watch off before. Does anyone know? Oh. Okay, great. 153. Okay, cool. We're good. So, uh, you know, I've, I, I'm, I've been thinking a lot lately about how we really do need to dismantle the system that we're in in order to rebuild it. And that's, 
like I said, this really great phase I hope we're in right now with media. I believe strongly in the power of media to create social change. That's why I do media for a living. And we need to actually uh, begin by like boldly rejecting the bullies and, and actually recognizing that sometimes the bully is us. I guarantee it. Because when I said that before, when I talked about how I was bullied, I bet a lot of you thought in your head, yeah, I've been bullied too. But when I said we need to reject the bullies, I'm wondering how many people in here thought, yeah, I'm the bully too. Because that's where we go into the discomfort. Oh, it sucks. It really does. Maybe have those vegan cheese sits nearby for a little bit. But it's uncomfortable for a reason. It's uncomfortable because we have to like address it in order to rebuild from a stronger perspective. And we need to have compassion for ourselves when we're recognizing that sometimes the bully is in fact us. If we don't dismantle this system, then marginalized groups will continue to suffer, animals will continue to suffer, and we will continue to suffer. We've all suffered. I have actually been in denial. I've second-guessed a lot of my own uh, story until I had to write it because I was under a contract to write it. So I was like forced to put it all on paper and forced to look at it, which was like a huge privilege that I had. But I really did second guess for a long time whether what I had gone through was an example of sexism or sexual harassment, partly because I was afraid and indoctrinated into this culture where women and queer people and so many other groups are secondary at best. So I have another uh, reading that I'd like to give to you, like final reading that I'll give to you today. And this is actually a fact to like body, you know, bodily integrity and like owning our body. It's funny because the process for me of like growing to like love this vessel that I'm in was not only a, a period of recognizing my own privilege as, uh, for having this body, but also it connected very specifically uh, to animal rights for me. Because I don't want anyone to be making these assumptions about me. I don't want anybody to have ownership over me like all these men did in my youth. I don't want anybody to assume that just because I'm queer, I'm there for their use. If I was like born a cow, I would be so annoyed if somebody was like, hey, you're gonna be food. <laughs> And if I didn't present the way I present, like if I was like butch, or if I was more genderqueer, then I wouldn't want someone to like identify me as like a lesbian walking down the street and then decide that it's okay for them to do whatever they want to to me or at me. So part of the process of like kind of coming to that for myself was actually uh, getting tattoos. And so that's something I write about in my book. It started on my, on my 18th birthday. It was like the first tattoo I ever got was on my 18th birthday. And I'd really been struggling with like my body image and like not wanting to be in this body because it was too much. Never enough, right? And so it's, I was living in Philadelphia at the time. It was 1997. And I was, I took myself out to South Street, which is like this kind of like, well, at the time, there was just like this main drag with lots of bars and shops and stuff. And I took myself out to South Street and I got myself a Slurpee <laughs> party kid that I was. That was my like present to myself on my 18th birthday. So I'm sitting there drinking my Slurpee and thinking about my body, thinking about like becoming an adult and all that. And I look across the street and there was uh, this psychic, like a psychic pop-up stand. And I was slurping my Slurpee and she sees me, of course. She's like, <laughs> and I'm like, you know, me? <laughs> okay. So I go over and, uh, you know, it's my 18th birthday. I think this is so cool. Like, this is the coolest thing. Her name is Tilly, obviously. And <laughs> she, like, sits me down and she's like, it's 20 bucks for a reading. And she proceeds to give me this, like, psychic, this, like, psychic read. It's like she sees into my soul. Like, she told me everything I needed to know about the world. And I felt so lucky. You know, my Slurpee was done by then. And I felt really good about the 20 bucks I just spent. And so anyway, <laughs> I went back to my little apartment thing for students and I told my friend, it was her birthday two weeks later, so I took her out to see Tilly. And I sat down with my friend and Tilly proceeded to give my friend the exact same reading as she had given me, like verbatim. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Tilly's a fake. <laughs> 
before I realized that Tilly was a fake, she had given me this piece of advice that I had already let seep in, which was to be bold. And so before I realized she was a fake and my Slurpee was done and I was still holding the empty container, I left her little pop-up psychic stand and I decided to make my first bold move to get a tattoo. I decided on a nickel-sized black star on my right shoulder blade. Why a star, asked the burly, unshaven 40-year-old tattoo artist wearing a ratty Nirvana t-shirt. My meeting with Tilly was making me feel a new sense of courage, and so I boldly said, because I'm going to be one. I closed my eyes just after those words escaped my mouth because I was sure that the tattoo artist was going to laugh at my proclamation just a smidge, just to make sure that I wouldn't notice, except I would have. So I closed my eyes instead and disappeared into my world of aspiring stardom and newfound adulthood. Let him laugh. Eventually, I was sure the joke would be on him and on everyone else who had ever decided I was less than because I was fat or foolish. Getting a tattoo wasn't something I'd ever seriously considered before that night because I was sure that it would have conflicted with my acting career. But a small black tattoo was, I figured, easily coverable. In high school, one of my classmates had a tattoo, and I remember being horrified by it. I went home and said to my mother, how could she just make a decision like that which will last the rest of her life? But I fixated on her tattoo unendingly, shocked by its permanence, intrigued by its confidence. When I was growing up in Edison, New Jersey, the only thing I considered permanent was my desire to get the hell out. As soon as the needle hit my skin and I felt a sensation that was very much reminiscent of a cat's scratch, I knew that there was no turning back. It's like that moment when you go in for a kiss with your beloved and attractive friend, crossing that line for good. There are no backseas allowed. Same with the tattoo. Much like my tattooed high school comrade, the permanence of the ink would forever memorialize this moment in my life and it would grow and evolve as I did. You're done, said the Nirvana guy. That's it? I asked, deciding then and there that I would be different now. That's it, he responded, handing me a mirror and then holding up another one so I could see the tattoo. There it was, a tiny black spot of proof that I belonged to myself. Wow, was all I could muster. A moment later, the tattooist looked me in the eyes for the first time and I noticed with a tenderness that surprised me that his were a deep royal blue. He smiled at me in a way you'd imagine a father would smile at his child on the first day of kindergarten or the last day of high school, and he said, I hope you do become a star. Aww. Maybe the world wasn't quite as mean as I always assumed. Thanks, I offered, then let a beat go by. Before I left, I quickly added, my tattoo is fabulous, but I think it's my last one. <laughs> if I'm going to be an actress, I can't exactly be full of tattoos. The Nirvana guy half smiled. Oh, you'll be back. <laughs> I rolled my eyes at him, or with him. Somehow I knew he was right. He was right. I wanted to tell you that story partly because like, it's not only this like kind of conceptual thing we're dealing with here. We're dealing with like bodies. We're dealing with like our bodies. We're dealing with like the bodies of the people next to us. We're dealing with like the bodies of the animals, the 286 chickens who are killed every second in the United States for food around the clock. We're dealing with the most effective way to approach that collectively and personally. And we're dealing with like reframing this structure. But I'm not an academic, like not at all. In fact, I went to school for theater. Like I rolled around on the floor until they gave me a BFA. <laughs> like I don't speak academic. I'm not like into putting out these like big concepts. I'm trying to like change myself and change the world in a way that is very practical. I can't tell you the end of this story. Like, I, I mean, there, you know, really, there is no end. My book, which, you know, I finished writing like three years ago because the nature of publishing, it's just like a moment in time in my life. It's gone now. It's just like this snippet. There's, you know, a lot that's different now. And uh, this moment is just a tiny moment in your day. So I don't know how this ends because like this is the end. The end is the beginning. It's like this ongoing thing. And, and also I don't want to tell you the end because I want you to buy my book. <laughs> but I digress. Um, I, I just hope you'll join me like on this, 
on this journey of like boldly questioning assumptions, of finding your truth, of telling your story. Because if we don't tell our story, nothing's going to change. Like we could join top-down organizational campaigns, we could sign petitions on change.org, and I think a lot of them are valuable, some of them are valuable, but I, <laughs> I think that like what we need to do first is to really sit with our discomfort and realize that it's gonna be okay. That like our bodies are beautiful, and that we are just as worthy of liberation as the animals who we're trying to fight for. It is all different spokes on the same wheel. And until we see ourselves as one of those spokes, like nothing's going to change. So find your truth and tell your story. And um, I hope to hear it someday. Thank you. Um,